Good morning. Beautiful morning. Great to see you here today. Didn't we have a great service last Sunday? Memorial service. I maybe shouldn't tell you this, but did you remember uh, last Sunday uh, the uh, black lady that was sitting with Dean and Sharon Shaneman back there? That lady's name is uh, Shamika Copeland, and she is a famous, and I mean famous, singer of blues. She was just in May, she won the album of the year, and uh, I mean, she is, she travels all over the world, and she sings blues, and she's, she was here, she didn't want to be recognized, she didn't want to, she just wanted to enjoy the service, but, uh, thought that was pretty neat. Probably all the rest of us singers here wouldn't have been worth much if we'd have known that at the time. <laughs> Let's see, announcements. Uh, we do have the carpet fund. We uh, started out, uh, you know, a couple months ago, I talked about we were at about $12,000. Well, uh, today, I can say we are at twenty-two. dollars or above, somewhere around there, unless somebody knows something more than I know. But uh, we are so close to our $25,000 uh, goal. So keep that in mind and keep that in your prayers and looking forward to being able to get started and enjoy the new carpet. We hope we can get the carpet in uh, before, in, in the basement anyway, before we start up the uh, new Year in the fall with a, a wana and so forth. Also, uh, it comes early. This is about the earliest that it can come. Next Saturday will be our men's fellowship breakfast at the log cabin at seven o'clock. So keep that <laughs> keep that in mind and come and uh, enjoy the fellowship that we we all have together. All right, we're going to, uh, Kenny Thomas is not with us today, uh, but uh, Emily Pilkington is going to come and lead us in our opening scripture. Dale's a lot taller than I am. Um, the responsive reading today is on page 421. So I'll give you a second to turn to that. Rejoice in him. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell you, I will tell of all of your wonders. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the peoples with justice. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in time of trouble. For those who know your name, let's trust in you. For you, Lord, have ever forsaken those who receive. Sing praises to the Lord enthroned in Zion, proclaim among the nations what he has done. And let us do rejoice in him that we have a new name in glory. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 419.
Okay, Emily. You read the scripture, so you're supposed to tell everybody the Greek. I'm <laughs> just teasing. That's okay. Let's turn and greet everyone this morning. Let's worship the Lord by giving our tithes and offerings. Father, thank you for the uh, blessings that each one of us uh, enjoy. And Lord, we want you to know that we don't take those for granted. We are blessed. So as we give, we pray today that you will truly bless what is given to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
with a spirit of excitement and inspiration, having sensed that the very presence and blessing of the Lord was here today and met with us as we worship together. And we know, Father, you are here. And we are so blessed. We're blessed that we have a new name written down in glory. And Father, we're looking forward to the wonderful day when we are in glory with you and, and all these earthly cares are behind us. And there is a new heaven and a new earth and all the blessings that that have been promised to us have been fulfilled. And in the meantime, Father, we want to serve you faithfully. We want to see, Father, that, that uh, our church grows and that lives are, are truly touched by the presence of, of uh, your Holy Spirit, the saving power of, of Jesus Christ. For in Christ alone is our hope today. Father, we just bring to you the special needs that we have before us. We, we continue to lift up uh, Don Wimberly in our prayers and Yvonne Fitz. And, and Father, we pray for Andrew today. We pray for Terry Ross. We lift up our brother Gene Manka. And Father, we just pray today that you will be with every person who calls Salem Congregational Church their home. Father, we only get uh, a very small number of those people that call their this church their home that come regularly. And Father, I just pray that you will lay it upon their hearts to be a part of their church and to recognize that they need to be more than just a name on the rolls, but they need to come and enjoy the fellowship and be encouraged because that's what we are here for, to, to encourage one another and lift up one another that's how we grow in, in our grace, Lord. And we just pray that you will lay a burden upon all of those people. Wonderful, wonderful, dear, precious people that, that call this church their home. That they will truly make it their home and come and fellowship and be part of the uh, services from week to week. And Father, today we pray for our nation. We thank you for the, the privilege, the wonderful privilege we thank you, Father, for the sacrifices that have been made down through the years for our freedoms. And Lord, we today don't want to take that for granted in any way. And Father, we thank you and bless you. Pray, we pray for our, our president. This is, the, this is the day that they have designated to pray for our president. And so we lift up President Trump and his family, Lord. You know the trials and the struggles that they face the difficulties that, that he faces in trying to be the chief administrator of the country. And Father, we just pray that you will be with him. We pray your protection upon him. We pray for your, your strength and your help. We pray for his family, Lord, that you will be with them and keep them and protect them. And Father, we lift up all those who are serving in our, in our government. We ask, Father, that you will work a miracle in our government that through the power of Jesus Christ, hearts and lives will be changed and, and uh, will be melted and they will melt together as one to do the things that need to be done for our country. And we will see so much of this hatred and, and bickering subside, Lord. This is our heart's desire. Thank you for those in Washington, D.C. who are lifting up the standard of, of, of the cross and those who are participating in Bible studies and prayers and those who are leading. Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will move in a wonderful way. We pray today for our military men and women around the world that you will keep them and bless their lives and their families, Lord, and the wounded warriors. We lift up our local community, Lord, and pray for our leaders here on the county and, and city level, Lord, and we pray for our, our, our policemen, our firemen, our Emergency medical people, we thank you for them and the service that they give to us from day to day. We just lift up our community to you and ask you to bless and work in the hearts and lives of, of all of the people here. And Father, we thank you today that we can come to you for worship and to uh, enjoy fellowship with one another and hear from your word. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Come to the Lord just as we are. Ask Him to light the fire again. This song is just this wonderful song of worship. We worship the Lord. We bow down before Him. We sing songs of praises. Hallelujah is ringing. Remember, hallelujah means let the people praise. So we want to let the hallelujahs ring this morning. Let's sing. associate program uh, with Fellowship of Christian Athletes um, here in the Panhandle and in eastern Wyoming. So um, I just, I'm just going to give you a little update. I know last year I shared a little bit and um, some of you partnered up with me and I appreciate that so much and I know that uh, God's going to do wonderful things with that um, last year. And so here's, I'm going to start off with a little video. So well, early service, we didn't get it to work, but this service, we got it down packed. So. In 1954, God implanted into the heart of a basketball coach a vision that sports could be used as a vehicle to share the message of Jesus Christ. This idea was so compelling that it impacted the influencers. There is a reason for this fellowship of Christian athletes. Athletics have the Christ. Why this thing of fellowship of Christian athletes seems to have arisen in the mind of a few men. But not just two or three gathered together. But millions of people everywhere dedicated to a common cause. 
So that's what, uh, if I were to title that slide, it would have been, what does FCA do? Um, and so uh, this is our vision, to see the world transformed by Jesus Christ through the influence of coaches and athletes. Um, and so uh, the gear of FCA, the, the focus is to and through the coach like they were talking about. And our mission is to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. Billy Graham said that, um, a coach will influence more people in one year than a normal person will in their entire lifetime. And so we've really taken that quote to heart and we've uh, seen God work in that and through that. Um, starting last summer, personally, especially through the school year, um, and then uh, seeing this strategy of two and through the coach play out. So as we pursue our vision and mission to the strategy of two and through the coach, we seek ministry first to coaches' hearts, marriages, and families. Um, and so I've seen this firsthand as uh, last year, I was able to uh, develop a relationship with a coach, um, and it turned into a weekly uh, supper at his house every week where I, was just, I would just go over with his family and we would just we would fellowship and we would eat and um, develop that relationship and that trust. And so the goal for that is to develop that relationship and it hopefully cultivate um, to where when they're ready we can then minister through the coach um, and by loving on them and uh, being the gospel to them through the coach so that they can minister to their fellow coaches, athletes and um, leaders and families so um, that's our strategy we call it equip, engage and empower and so we equip the coach uh, with resources uh, we engage with the coach by developing that uh, relationship, by serving them, and then empower them ultimately to 
be a disciple who makes disciples by God's grace. So, um, what will I be doing this summer? Uh, my goals are to develop some coaches, Bible studies in the area, uh, with some coaches that I've developed some relationships with, um, and to see God move in that. Uh, so be praying for that. I'll be serving at three camps. Um, the Northern Black Hills FCA camp, which is the last week of June, we have 350 to 400 athletes attending that. Um, this summer through 10 to 12 different sports. Um, so if you would be praying for that as well. And then there's a leadership camp the week after that where coaches will send their athletic leaders um, and uh, anybody, any athlete who wants to be involved in that where it will be more of a leadership focus, uh, still serving and empowering kids there. And then building eternal relationships is kind of the umbrella uh, of, this, of my summer vision and that's uh, it's just so cool to see God um, cultivate those, work through people, uh, and the, one thing that I've learned is that the kingdom is relational and that um, we're not meant to do this alone and that God will have those in store. So um, I appreciate your support so much last summer, prayerfully and financially. Uh, this summer, um, I would ask that you also continue to be praying for uh, the ministry um, and what God's called me into this summer uh, for the coaches and for the athletes, so to direct them um, into a relationship with God and with His, uh, with his church um, and gearing them towards, towards being a part of a body of believers. And so um, this summer I am doing uh, something similar to that, so I... Uh, would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting me financially. Um, I know that uh, God will use it powerfully. Um, I've seen him use, uh, like last year, just the influence through uh, partners and supporters. Uh, the, uh, the impacts have been eternal and tremendous. And so um, I will be around uh, after service. So if you would i uh, like to talk to me about that. I'd love to get your information and stuff, and then we can go from there. But um, So I thank you so much. Uh, Pastor, I thank you for letting me, letting me share. And um, I know that God's going God's to gonna work, and he's moving. So thank you, thank you. Now it's his turn. <laughs> Wonderful to have young people that are serving the Lord, and Jared is part of our congregation, and so the work and ministry that he's involved in, we're part of, aren't we? So um, he's going to be in the back after the service, and if you want to to uh, share with him, and have a partner with him in a financial way, or just tell him you're going to be praying for him, uh, Take a little time and do that. It's just exciting to know that this kind of ministry is, is uh, available for us and uh, our young people to be a part of. So I want to talk to you this morning about uh, something Jesus taught when he said, it's not what goes in, but what comes out. Uh, the passage we're looking at is Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20. And I'd like us to just read this together, shall we? And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. 
And when Jesus spoke these words and told these words to the, the Pharisees, they were shocked. They were shocked. And there's a reason why. And I want to just uh, share a little teaching with you about the things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees believed back in those days. Hey guys, today's topic is the rules of the Pharisees. So if you've been reading your Bible at all, you've probably heard this term before. Jesus talked to the Pharisees a lot. The Pharisees were kind of the bad guys in the New Testament, not because they were terrible people, it's because they were religious people, but they missed the whole point behind it. So they were all about keeping all of the rules um, of the Old Testament, the Jewish rules. But their mindset was, well, this is how you get to heaven. You get to heaven by keeping all the rules. So let's break down those rules for you. First of all, there's something called the Mosaic Law. Now, the word Mosaic, you can see the name Moses is in there. So when we say Mosaic Law, we're talking about the law that was given through Moses. So it actually started with Moses and the Ten Commandments, but that was just the first ten of a total of 613 total laws that the Pharisees actually had in the Mosaic Law. So that's the first part, the Ten Commandments, that's the cornerstone of the Mosaic Law, and then all of the other laws in addition to that, and the Pharisees knew all of them. Now the second thing is called the Midrash. Now this was additional teachings that came from rabbis, so this this would be more sermons, more clarifying ideas and concepts and teachings to help bolster the 613 uh, laws in the Mosaic Law. So as if those 613 weren't hard enough, now the Midrash was adding all of this other stuff that in, in essence all of that stuff became part of the law code. So it kind of all rose to the surface of this is all important, you better know all of it, and you better follow all of it. So here's an example of the Midrash. Uh, take the commandment that says you should keep the Sabbath day holy, commandment number four. Well, they added to that 39 regulations, helping you to know exactly, exactly what that meant to keep the Sabbath day holy, all the way down to like how many steps you could take on a Sabbath day. So there, were, there was the main law, the fourth commandment, and then there was this, all this other stuff clarifying it that really sort of rose to the level of being a law, and stuff clarifying that clarifying stuff. And pretty soon you had this massive web of rules and regulations and laws that the Pharisees all knew and tried to follow to the letter of the law. So here's the problem of the Pharisees. And again, if you read the New Testament and you see how Jesus interacts with the Pharisees, you'll see this. The problem is it was all legalism. It was all about following the letter of the law rather than really understanding the heart and intent of the law. You know, Jesus answered them in Matthew 22 when they asked what's the most important law and they had all these laws in mind. And Jesus said, it's just simply this, love God, love others as yourself. But they had sort of forgotten all of that. They had lost sight of all of that. They were trying to get to God through the law. They were trying to be made right with God through the law, which no one can do rather than depending on what Jesus did for us that sets us free so that we can begin to live from the inside out. Take a look at this verse from Jesus. Speaking of the Pharisees, he said, What sorrow awaits you teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Here's the takeaway for Christians today. If you're watching this with your family, with a small group or a mentor, I want you to think, what part of that can I relate to? You know, it's so easy to take our religion, to take our faith, and to turn it into a bunch of rules. Now, Jesus never said the rules were bad or wrong. They're not bad or wrong. But the rules just show us God's heart. And the rules show us that we can't, we can't really live up to them without Jesus. So if the rules and the laws don't push us closer and closer to Jesus, then we're missing the whole point. So ask yourself for today, ask yourself, hey, am I a Pharisee? Do I have a little bit of Phariseeism in me? And if you do, root it out, because Jesus couldn't stand it. Now you see why they were shocked, because Jesus was, was telling them that it's, 
It's what's in the heart that counts, not all of the external things that, uh, that you do. And there's, a, there's some reasons why the external uh, rules and regulations and all that are a problem. And I want to give you a couple of those. Uh, problem with external regulations. First of all, it's too easy. It's too easy. It is, uh, it's easy to wash your hands. It's easy to observe some uh, stipulation or regulation. That, that, doesn't take, that doesn't take much. But it's hard to move beyond that and to get out and to love the unlovable, to help uh, the need of someone else sacrificially, to use your own time, your own money, to, to, uh, to move out of your comfort zone to help somebody else because of love that's, that's in your heart. Also, um, it's easy to, to be able to, to, you know, to go to church and to give and attend Bible studies. Those are great things. Those are wonderful things for us to do, to be involved in the church. And we've already I prayed about that today. People would become involved in, and we need to do that. Those, those are important important things to do, but they are not a means to God. They are a reflection of our relationship with God. He wants us to have a personal relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. He wants to get inside of us, into our hearts, and then once He is there and He is working in our life, then these other things that we do take on meaning because we understand why we are doing them. We're doing it because we, we love God and we want to, we want to grow. We want to, to honor Him. You know, a lot of the Old Testament laws uh, we look at today, they, they seem kind of weird, but a lot of them were given for, for good reasons. Uh, having to do with the culture in which they lived in those days, a lot of them were hygienic in nature to prevent disease and so forth. And uh, they, they had a good basis. But doing them was not the way to get to God. God wanted to come in and to, to be a part of their, their individual lives. It comes from having that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not only is it uh, too easy, but it is also misleading. And uh, the uh, speaker on the video pointed this out in the scripture that he showed him that Jesus gave about the whitewashed tombs. And on, on the outside, they were beautiful, but on the inside, they were, they were uh, ugly. And it's misleading. Many people can live faultless lives. They, from an outward appearance, they, they've got it together and they're living faultless lives. How many times have you seen uh, family relationships, for example, uh, where a family has been, uh, you know, you got a mom and dad and a couple of kids and they just seem as happy as they can be and they are, you know, they're the all-American type of family and you just maybe envy them a little bit. They have such a beautiful family. And then all of a sudden, they break up. You don't know what goes on inside that family structure and relationship. They can put on a good show externally, and that's what many people can do. They can, they can put on a good show externally, but inside they can be filled with all kinds of bitterness and, and evil thoughts. Jesus taught that all the outward observances in the world cannot atone for a heart that is filled with ungodliness and bitterness. Only Jesus takes care of that. He died on the cross for that. That's why He died. To, to save us from ourselves. To save us from that. He is the only one that is able to help us to get to God. Not by putting on outward appearances of something good and and uh, faking it, you might say, and trying to do everything to get to God. 
So many people, it's like if you ask them, it's, are you going to go to heaven? They say, well, I hope so. You know, I, I'm, I try to live a good life and, you know, treat others with respect. And I, I think I'm just as good as, as the next person and so forth. They miss the point. They're not going to get to God that way. The only way to get to God is by receiving the gift, the gift, and it is a gift of salvation that Jesus provided by dying on the cross for our sins and receiving His righteousness in our life so that God looks at us from the perspective of what Jesus has done for us. So, Jesus wants us to know that it is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of the heart. The part that really matters in our life is what is within our hearts. Jesus taught, and we have it in the Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount one of the Beatitudes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It doesn't say, blessed are the pure in their behavior. Blessed are those who are living the exemplary life, for they shall see God. No, it's the pure in heart. And a pure in heart person is a person who has had his heart cleansed by Jesus Christ. Jesus taught that, that uh, God is not so much interested in how we act, but why we act the way we do. It's the why of why we do the things that we do that he's interested in. King David was called the man after God's own heart. And yet he did some very grievous things in his life and he, he sinned, but he, he, he had a heart for God and he always came back and he repented and he, he recognized that he was at God's mercy and God's mercy alone. William Barclay said that it's Jesus' teaching, and it is a teaching that uh, condemns every one of us, that people cannot call themselves good because they observe external rules and regulations. They can call themselves good only when their hearts are pure. And that happens when Christ comes in and cleanses the heart. Christ died for our sins and he made it possible for us to be part of the family of God because of what he did. And so that's the end of pride for us. We can't have pride in how we behave and so forth because we can never live up to God's standard. All we can do is we come before God and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And as we go to the Lord's table today to partake of communion, I want you to understand that, <clears throat> that we're not coming just to do something for the sake of doing something. I, one thing I enjoy about, uh, about our church is that we partake of communion once a month. I was raised in a church, and I think this church was even, even did that in years past, where we only took communion maybe three or four times a year. And the argument was, if you do it every Sunday, it becomes just routine, you're just doing something, you know, like the Pharisees. No. Same thing with our saying our affirmation of faith every week. Some have criticized that look on our churches that do that, well, it's just a ritual of form you do. No. It's not. And I hope that I, as your pastor, have kept that alive for you to realize that we, when we affirm our faith, we're doing something that comes from the heart. And Jesus gave us communion from his heart. And we are to come and, and uh, say to him when we come, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And thank you, Jesus for dying for our sins. And I recognize through this bread and this cup that these are symbols of what Jesus did for me on the cross so that I can have a heart that's pure. <clears throat> Father, we thank you and we bless you today for giving us Jesus. We know, we know, Father, that there is no way that we can earn our way to heaven. 
Some of us have tried it. We know that just doesn't work out too well. The Pharisees tried it. It did not work out well for them. But when Jesus came, suffered and died and paid the penalty of the cross, he, he broke that veil, that curtain in two, and made it possible for us to come into this wonderful relationship with Jesus, not because of things that we have done, but because of what He has done in Christ alone. We thank you and bless you for that. And we come to the Lord's table today and we come as those who have, who have been forgiven from our sins and rejoice in what Jesus has done for us. And we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, I want us to sing the familiar song, Just As I Am Without One Plea. Because that's what it is, isn't it? We do come just as we are. Nothing that we're going to bring to this altar is going to impress God except a humble heart before Him. Let's stand together and sing verses 1, 2, and 4. And while we're singing, the deacons and your families, if you will come to the altar, I will serve you and then you can serve the congregation. Hymn 343, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Likewise also, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood which is for you. As oft as ye drink it, do so in remembrance of me. stand together and say the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's join together now and sing God be with you till we meet again. 